Some of them were dreamers. Some of them were fools who were making plans and thinking of the future. With the energy of the innocent, they were gathering the tools they would need to make their journey back to nature. And while the sand slipped through the opening and their hands reached for the golden ring, with their hearts they turned to each other's hearts for refuge. In the troubled years that came before the deluge, Some of them knew pleasure, some of them knew pain, and for some of them it was only the moment that mattered. On the brave and crazy wings of you, they went flying around in the rain, and their feathers once so fine grew torn and tattered. And in the end, they traded their tired wings for the resignation that living brings and exchanged love's bright and fragile glow for the glitter and the rude. And in a moment, they were swept before the deluge. Let the music keep our spirits high. The buildings keep our children bright. Let creation reveal its secrets by and by. By and by. When the light that's lost within us reaches the sky, some of them. By the men who learned how to forge her beauty into power. And they struggled to protect her from them, only to be confused by the magnitude of her fury in the final hour. And when the sand was gone and the time arrived, in the naked dog, only a few survive, and in attempts to understand things so simple and so huge, believe that they were meant to live after the deluge. Let the music keep our spirits high. Let the buildings keep our children dry. Let creation reveal its secrets by and by. By and by. When the light that's lost within us reaches the sky. Reaches the sky. Now it's my turn. <coughs> Hiroshima commemorates August 6th, 1945, the day when an atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima, followed a few days later by another drop on the city of Nagasaki. Today, on the 78th anniversary of that day, we come together with three folks from Syracuse Peace Council to discuss the history, urgency, and what can be done about the danger of nuclear weapons. 
Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Utica. I'm John Camilleri, coordinator of Soul Matters Small Group Ministry. If you're joining us for the first time in person or online, a special welcome. So whether you are visiting us for the first time or you've been a longtime member, you are welcome here. Whatever faith traditions you have known, if any, whomever you love, whatever gender, gender identity you embrace, you are welcome here. We invite you to bring your whole selves to this service. Our congregation acknowledges that the land on which the church is situated is the ancestral land of the Oneida people. On this land, in this church, we are a people who build a faith community. We have two announcements today. Jack? Hi, everyone. Um, you probably know about the uh, church picnic, which is going to uh, take place in place of the regular service next Sunday. Um, it's going to be in the form of a potluck, so um, there's a sign-up sheet right outside the sanctuary, if you could sign up um, for whatever you're going to be bringing, or if you're online or want to do it later on, um, send me uh, an uh, email. Uh, my uh, email is in the uh, uh, newsletter. Um, we do need, in order, it's going to be in the form of potluck, but we may have hot dogs and hamburgs and veggie burgers there. But in order to do that, we need a grill. So in order to get a grill, we're going to need a volunteer to, uh, to bring a grill. So if somebody can contact me in the next day or two so we can complete our planning, um, uh, if, uh, if you want to donate a grill, that would be greatly appreciated. Also, we're going to need volunteers. Now, normally setting up and tearing down, normally everybody chips in. But if somebody uh, feels especially uh, drawn to doing the grilling, that would also be appreciated. Thank you. Right. I'm not sure if everybody online heard that, but um, if you're coming to the uh, to the uh, uh, church picnic next week, the Climate Action Committee would encourage people to bring their own reusable place settings um, for obvious reasons. Um, thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jerry Reed. I do the newsletter, but I also this year I'm coordinating Pride Day or our activities of Pride Day at the New York State Fair. And that is um, August 25th, a Friday. We're one of the major sponsors of the Information Fair, and we have a table and uh, need people. Um, we have actually um, most of the day covered, but if you have some time and can give a couple of hours, we could use somebody between uh, 4 and 6 p.m. on uh, that day. And if you feel inclined, you can also march in the Pride Day uh, parade that happens at 6 o'clock. But uh, if anybody can help, um, and even if you can't fill in on that particular time, there are other times where we'll welcome um, two people to be there at the same time. So we'll have information, we'll have uh, um, literature to pass out to people to promote our church. So if anybody can help, um, please uh, see me or uh, send me an email through the newsletter. Thank you very much. For our call to worship, we share excerpts of a resolution from the participants of the um, Unitarian Universalist United Nations Office 2017 Intergenerational Spring Seminar. 
we resolve to urge all 193 member states of the United Nations to complete the nuclear weapons prohibition treaty and put it into force. 122 countries approved this treaty in July of 2017. We resolve to educate our faith communities about the destructive tolls of nucle nuclear weapons, small arms, and state-sponsored violence. We resolve to ask our congregations to dedicate at least one worship service each year to recognize victims of armed violence and to use that service to initiate sustained dialogue and action. So we come together today to do that. With those goals in mind, we light our chalice with the words of Elizabeth McMaster. We light our flaming chalice to eliminate, illuminate the world we seek. In the search for truth, may we be just. In the search for justice, may we be loving. And in loving, may we find peace. Our opening hymn is 177, Sakura. Melissa and Kim will lead us with the words on the insert in your order of service. Hello. Uh, our Together Time book is Sadako by Eleanor Kaur with illustrations by Ed Young. And I want you to know before I start, I have abridged the story. I will have the full picture book in the back if you want to hear the whole thing. I'll read it to you anytime. <laughs> 
One morning in August 1954, Sadako Sasaki looked up at the blue sky over Hiroshima and saw not a cloud in the sky. It was a good sign. Sadako was always looking for good luck signs. Get up, lazy bones, she said to her siblings. Rushing like a whirlwind into the kitchen, Sadako cried, Mother, can we please hurry with breakfast? I can hardly wait for the carnival. You must not call it a carnival, her mother said. It is a memorial day for those who died when the atom bomb was dropped on our city. Your own grandmother was killed, and you must show respect. But I do respect Obasan, Sadako said. It's just that I feel so happy today. At the entrance to the Peace Park, people filed through the memorial building in silence. On the walls were photographs of the ruined city after the atom bomb, the thunderbolt, had instantly turned Hiroshima into a desert. I remember the thunderbolt, Sadako whispered to her friend. There was the flash of a million suns. Then the heat prickled my eyes like needles. How could you possibly remember anything? Chizuko exclaimed. You were only a baby then. Well, I do, said Sadako stubbornly. It was the beginning of autumn when Sadako rushed into the house with good news. The most wonderful thing has happened, she said breathlessly. The big race on field day, I've been chosen to be on the relay team. That was what Sadako wanted more than anything else. From then on, Sadako thought of only one thing, the relay race. She practiced every day at school and often ran all the way home. Maybe, she thought, I will be the fastest runner in the world. At last, the big day arrived. Sadako was so nervous, she was afraid her legs wouldn't work at all. But at the signal to start, Sadako forgot everything but the race. When it was her turn, she ran with all the strength she had. Her heart thumped painfully against her ribs when the race was over. It was then that a strange, dizzy feeling came over her. She scarcely heard when someone cried, Sadako, your team won! The class surrounded her cheering and shouting. She shook her head a few times and the dizziness went away. On New Year's Eve, Mrs. Sasaki hung good luck symbols above the door to protect her family all through the year. As soon as we can afford it, I'll buy you a kimono, she promised. A girl your age should have one. For several weeks, it seemed like the good luck symbols were working. Sadako felt strong and healthy, and she ran faster and faster. But all that ended one crisp, cold winter day in February, when Sadako was running in the schoolyard. Suddenly, everything seemed to whirl around her, and she sank to the ground. Soon, Sadako was in an examining room in the hospital, where the nurse took some of her blood. Sadako heard the doctor say the word leukemia. That was the sickness caused by the atom bomb. She put her hands over her ears, not wanting to hear any more. Do I really have the atom bomb disease? She asked anxiously. The doctors want to take some tests, that's all, her father told her. They might keep you here a few weeks. To Sadako, it seemed like years. What about the relay team? When her family left for the night, she had never felt so lonely. The next day, Chizuko came to visit, smiling mysteriously. I figured out a way for you to get well, she said proudly. Watch. She cut a piece of gold paper into a large square and folded it over and over until it became a beautiful crane. Don't you remember the old story about the crane? Chizuko asked. It's supposed to live for a thousand years. If a sick person folds 1,000 paper cranes, the gods will grant her wish and make her well again. She handed the golden crane to Sadako. Here's your first one. Thank you, Sadako whispered. I'll never part with it. That night, 
Sadako felt safe and lucky. She set to work folding cranes. One day, her nurse wheeled Sadako out onto the porch for some sunshine. There she met Kenji. He was nine and small for his age, with a thin face and shining dark eyes. Kenji said, well, I have leukemia from the bomb. I'll die soon. Sadako didn't know what to say. She wanted so much to comfort him. She told him about her paper cranes. I know about the cranes, he said quietly, but it's too late. Even the gods can't help me now. One day, Kenji didn't appear on the porch, and Sadako, Sadako knew that he had died. I'm going to die next, aren't I? Of course not, her nurse said. Just fold another crane before you go to sleep. In July, it was warm and sunny, and Sadako seemed to be getting better. I'm over halfway to a thousand cranes, so something good is going to happen. And it did. Her appetite came back, and much of the pain went away. She was going to go home for Oban, the biggest holiday of the year. After they had eaten, her sister handed Sadako a big box tied with a red ribbon. Slowly, Sadako opened it. Inside was a silk kimono with cherry blossoms on it. Sadako felt hot tears blur her eyes. Why did, she, why did you do it? She asked. Silk costs so much money. Sadako, her father said gently, your mother stayed up late last night to finish sewing it. Try it on for her. Everyone agreed that she looked like a princess. Sadako let out a happy sigh. But by the end of the week, Sadako was weak again and had to return to the hospital. The class sent her a Kokeshi doll to cheer her up. Sadako placed it on the bedside table next to the golden crane. For the next few days, Sadako drifted in and out of a strange kind of half sleep. When I die, she said dreamily, Will you put my favorite bean cakes on the altar for my spirit? And put a lantern on the Ota River for me on peace day? As Sadako grew weaker, she wondered, did it hurt to die? Or was it like falling asleep? Would she live on a heavenly mountain or a star? She fumbled with a, paper, with a piece of paper and clumsily folded one more bird. 644. Her mother came in and felt her forehead. She gently took the paper away. As Sadako closed her eyes, she heard her mother whisper, O flock of heavenly cranes, cover my child with your wings. When she opened her eyes again, Sadako saw her family there beside the bed. She looked around at their faces and smiled. She knew that she would always be a part of their warm, loving circle. Sadako looked up at the flock of paper cranes hanging from the ceiling. As she watched, a light autumn breeze made the birds rustle and sway. They seemed to be alive and flying out through the open window. Sadako sighed and closed her eyes. How beautiful and free they were. Sadako Sasaki died on October 25th. 1955. Her friends and classmates worked together to fold 356 paper cranes so that she would be buried with 1,000. In a way, she got her wish. She will live on in the hearts of the people who hear her story. Now there is a statue of Sadako in Hiroshima Peace Park. She is standing on a mountain of paradise holding a golden crane in outstretched hands. Every year on Peace Day, children hang garlands of paper cranes under the statue. Their wish is engraved on its base. This is our cry. This is our prayer. Peace in the world. The end. And we have origami at the back table if you would like to try your hand at folding a paper crane or a paper or something else.
Thank you, Stephanie. Katie Spire suggested today's Hiroshima Day service several months ago. Jeff contacted the Syracuse Peace Council and Diane Swords volunteered to be with us today. Diane is a member of the Nucle Nuclear Free World Committee of the Peace Council and is on the National Steering Committee of Back from the Brink. Diane will be introducing two colleagues who are with her. This is just their first stop today. Diane, Aya, Chloe, thank you for joining us. I'll, I'll invite you up. I'll just say briefly that Aya is our fairly recently hired staff, second staff person of Syracuse Peace Council. She's also uh, going into her senior year at Lemoyne College. And uh, I'm really happy to introduce her. And I think you'll introduce Chloe, right? Yes. <laughs> thank you, Diane. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I stand before you today alongside members of the Syracuse Peace Council. We gather here not only as advocates for peace, but also as individuals deeply committed to raising awareness about one of the darkest moments in history atrocities in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. As members of the Peace Council, our mission since 1936 has been to promote nonviolence, social justice, and a world free from the specter of war. We believe that by understanding and acknowledging the tragic events of the past, we can better shape a future that embraces peace, compassion, and global cooperation. 78 years ago, on August 6 and 9, 1945, the world witnessed the devastating power of nuclear weapons when the United States dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The bombings of these two Japanese cities marked the climax of World War II and forever altered the course of human warfare. The immediate impact was catastrophic with an estimated 200,000 lives lost, many of whom were innocent civilians, including women and children. The cities were reduced to rubble and Countless of the survivors suffered severe injuries and long-term health consequences due to the in intense radiation exposure. Beyond the staggering loss of life, which continues to this day due to radiation, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki also left a lasting impact on our collective consciousness. They marked the beginning of the nuclear age and introduced a new era of global fear and uncertainty. The specter of nuclear warfare has loomed over us ever since, and the existential threat it poses to humanity remains a pressing concern to this day. But let us not forget that out of this tra tragedy arose a vital call for peace and nuclear disarmament. The survivors, known as Hibakusha, have become powerful advocates for peace and nonproliferation, sharing their harrowing experiences to, to ensure that future generations never forget the horrors of nuclear war. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki stand as a stark reminder of the potential consequences of unchecked aggression, hatred, and the dest destructive power of technology. They teach us that we must embrace, embrace diplomacy, understanding, and compassion if we are to prevent such atrocities from ever happening again. As we remember the victims and survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, let us commit ourselves to the pursuit of a world free from the threat of nuclear weapons. It is our responsibility to learn from history and work tirelessly towards a future where peace and cooperation and diplomacy reign. We must also recognize that the lessons from history are not confined to the past. The dangers of nuclear proliferation persist in our world today reminding us that the consequences of unchecked aggression and hatred are as real now as they were then. In the spirit of remembrance and responsibility, we turn our attention to the present challenges we face. With Chloe, our SPC intern. Thank you, Aya, for educating us on the history of August 6th and 9th and calling attention to the horrors of nuclear weapons. 
As we move forward, armed with this knowledge of the immense horrors nuclear weapons inherently possess, we must stay informed of and analyze the role nuclear weapons currently has in 2023. In our past decade, it has been more obvious than ever that we must remain vigilant and engaged in this pursuit of a nuclear-free world. To see where we are in a 2023 world, we can look to the infamous Doomsday Clock. The Doomsday Clock is a symbolic representation of the perceived global risk of nuclear war and other existential threats. It is maintained by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and serves as a measure of how close humanity is to potential catastrophe with midnight symbolizing the point of no return. Their most recent calculation is that we're 90 seconds to midnight, the closest the potential, the potential catastrophe has ever been predicted. This clock is not merely an abstract concept. It is based on expert analysis and judgment from leading scientists and policymakers who closely monitor the state of the world. It considers factors such as geopolitical tensions, nuclear developments, environmental degradation, and advancements in technology. Together, we must strive to turn back the hands of the doomsday clock and safeguard the future of our humanity. We need to turn back the clock or else there is potential for devastation on an unimaginable scale. The atomic bombs dropped during World War II were primitive compared to the advanced thermonuclear devices developed later. Modern nuclear warheads possess a potency of thousands of times greater than those that devastated Japan, capable of leaving entire cities in an instant of leveling entire cities in an instant. And in 2018, an accident did happen. A chilling incident unfolded in Hawaii that sent shockwaves of fear and panic across the islands. A false alarm was issued, warning residents of an imminent ballistic missile threat, pushing them to seek immediate shelter and stating that the alert was not a drill. The alarm, the alarm persisted for a nerve wracking 38 minutes and 13 seconds before authorities publicly announced that it was a mistake. Those excruciating minutes saw people grappling with terror and contemplating the worst possible outcome. This incident exposed the fragility of our nuclear safety systems and reminded us all that even accidental actions can have catastrophic consequences. This harrowing event highlighted how quickly a simple error could escalate into unthinkable tragedy. It served as a sobering reminder of the immense responsibility held by those tasked with safeguarding the world against nuclear disasters. The gravity of the situation became apparent as it was revealed that the false alarm had come dangerously close to launching a catastrophic nuclear weapon. Moreover, we must confront the issue of a lack of common sense within our government and others around the world. We are all too aware that decisions made by our leaders profoundly impact our lives and the world at large. We look to our government for guidance and protection, but as our US government fails to exercise common sense in its action and policies, we all bear the consequences. Nuclear weapons were dangerous in the 40s and have progressed to even more frightening levels of potential destructions in the 2020s. Now we move to Diane to see what we all can do to prevent nuclear catastrophe. There we go, I got it. I'm so glad to be here with you. I really so appreciate the service so far. The music is wonderful. The uh, Stephanie, your reading of the story, thank you so much. And I do have to mention, uh, hanging on the front of the podium are a thousand cranes. Um, these cranes were given to Joanna Macy. Some of you may know that name. And she sent them home to me with a mutual friend of ours. And so I keep them and rarely take them out of my house and the plastic bag that uh, keeps them safe and covered. So I'm really happy to have them here today. How can we, as people of faith, respond to the horror of the use of nuclear weapons that leveled two cities, as Aya has described? And how do we, as, as people who care about morality, respond to this current dangerous time of heightened international tension and renewed efforts to build more and more nuclear weapons with the real risk of human annihilation? 
as Chloe summarized. Why would anyone of goodwill support these weapons of mass destruction unlike any others? There are many misconceptions, and I'm going to mention two. The idea that since Hiroshima and Nagasaki were able to rebuild after the war, sometimes lulls people into thinking that, well, war is terrible, but we survive. That is just no longer the case because of the extreme of the power and uh, number of nuclear weapons and the fact that any use is likely to escalate so we can't think that even even if we were thinking that well war is just going to happen we have to we can't help it we have to stop it the second um, huge misconception that i'm going to mention uh, was raised by chloe in talking about um, the, the idea that we won't use these weapons because they're much too terrible, that idea is called deterrence in political language, but deterrence depends on two things. It depends on the rationality of governments, as Chloe mentioned, and it depends on no accidents happening, as she also mentioned. But that so many people believe these myths is very disturbing. The danger we're in feels overwhelming. We could lose hope. I've been reading Paolo Ferreri's The Pedagogy of Hope. He says somewhat playfully, there's no hope in sheer hopefulness. The hoped for is not attained by dint of raw hoping. Then he goes on to say, without a minimum of hope, we cannot so much as start the struggle. But without the struggle, hope dissipates, loses its bearings, and turns into hopelessness. He says hope must be learned, and he calls for an education in hope. By this, this he means learning the content of social justice, methods of finding facts rather than settling for idle, idle opinions, and collectivity working together. So we at Syracuse Peace Council are in the struggle, studying social justice, finding the facts, and working collectively beyond our local area with uh, groups across the state and with the national Back from the Brink campaign to prevent nuclear war. And that is also connected to international struggles. The campaign is not raw hope, but active hope, by the way, the title of a book Joanna Macy wrote. Um, I urge you to look her up. This, uh, pro this campaign of Back from the Brink promotes legislation and advocacy for five achievable goals. To overturn the current policy under which the US retains the option to use nuclear weapons first in a conflict to take weapons off hair trigger alert as almost cost us our planet in the Hawaii incident, to stop the sole authority of any president to launch a nuclear war, to stop wasting precious resources needed to address climate and human needs on more and more dangerous nuclear weapons, and to pressure our government to participate in the Treaty on the Prohibition of nuclear weapons that was mentioned in the 2017 proclamation that was read at the beginning of the service. We work in many ways, educating the public, working with legislators, promoting endorsement of the Back from the Brink campaign, and encouraging divestment from nuclear industries. Many legislators have endorsed the campaign at federal, state, and local levels. You can be part of this action and part of the hope. Do you think your congregation might endorse the campaign? A number of uni Unitarian congregations already have endorsed, and the National Unitarian Universalist Association has endorsed, and I see that your congregation is a member of that group. 
As for legislators, I believe you are in the same congressional district as Syracuse with Brandon Williams as your representative. He should hear from all of us. Perhaps more important in this case is to focus on your local representatives. Their endorsement magnifies your individual ones. In Syracuse, we have endorsements from 20 local organizations and 10 local representatives, including our mayor. Mayor Walsh speaks eloquently about why it's a no-brainer to support this campaign. It's a local issue to prevent annihilation. And it's a local issue to use resources for our communities. Can you put hope into action with us? Expanding our collective power is essential. Let us renew the commitment to care for each other, to reject the mistreatment of any living beings and the earth, to speak out, to learn, to fight, and yes, to hope. And I'll just mention that we do have a petition for the five points of uh, the, the um, Back from the Brink campaign that are, are now a congressional um, uh, resolution um, called House Resolution 77. We have petitions um, out in the back. And um, there's also a QR code for a letter if you would like to uh, write something about this to your uh, local and state and national representatives. Thank you so much. Thank you, Diane, Aya, and Chloe. Our next hymn is hymn 167 in the gray hymnal, Nothing But Peace Is Enough. So what's in your hymnal is uh, the chorus, actually, to a Jim Scott song. And so I went and got the entire Jim Scott song. So I'm going to teach you guys the chorus, and you're going to sing along the chorus part. And uh, I'm going to do the verses, and Kim is going to help you guys out. So we'll do it for you once uh, so you can hear it, and then we'll give you guys a try. Nothing but peace is enough for me. Nothing but peace is enough. Nothing but peace is enough. Nothing but peace is enough for me. Sound good? So how about you guys can stand as you are willing and able, and I'll let you know, uh, we'll start with the chorus, and then I'll let you know every time it's your turn to come in. One, two, three, four. Nothing but peace is enough for me. Nothing but peace is enough. Nothing but peace is enough. Nothing but peace is enough for me. Well, I'm feeling such mixed emotions right now. I've got to say this to someone. We've got to do this more than just holidays. Got to be in it for the long run. For the long run. Now your turn. Nothing but peace is enough for me. Nothing but peace is enough. Nothing but How can weapons of war be weapons of peace? We're fighting in a different fashion. We too are working for peace through strength, though our strength is in our compassion. In our compassion. Your turn. Nothing but peace is enough for me. Nothing but peace is enough. Nothing but Stuff, but more of the world we are reaching. To the makers of war, we say we've had enough. 
It's only peace we are teaching. We are teaching. Go. Peace is enough for me. Nothing but peace is enough. Nothing but peace is enough. Nothing but peace is enough for me. The freedom to speak and the freedom to choose. A right and a responsibility. Without vigilance, freedoms are easy to lose. And there's no freedom without equality. Without equality. One more time. Nothing but peace is enough for me. Nothing but peace is enough. Nothing but Now we extinguish this chalice with the words in your order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. Our benediction today is from Steve J. Crump. That which is worthy of doing, create with your hands. That which is worthy of repeating, speak with a clear voice. That which is worthy of remembering, hold in your hearts. And that which is worthy of living, go and live it now. sing loud enough that he doesn't hear my untuned guitar. I was looking at the uh, picnic sign-up list out there, and I saw Jack and Kim on it. <laughs> that was all I saw. So I really hope that uh, we'll have some participation at the picnic and uh, some people to enjoy the food and the uh, loan of a grill, if that can <coughs> Okay. So this is definitely an audience participation song. I'm pretty sure you know it. Uh, I'm gonna lay down my burden down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. I'm gonna lay down my burden. Down by the riverside, I'm gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. No more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. I'm gonna lay sword and shield down by the riverside down by the riverside down by the riverside i'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside I'm gonna study war no more ain't gonna study war no more ain't gonna study war no more ain't gonna study war no more
Study. 